Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are so pleased to have Dr. Peter Forster and Dr. Kelsey Schroffnagel with us, and they will be discussing bipolar depression. Within their talk, they will review literature on treatments of bipolar depression, both medication as well as other approaches, and will integrate this information into their clinical experience at the Gateway Psychiatric Mood Disorders Clinic in San Francisco. Dr. Forrester is the clinical director of this clinic, and he was previously the medical director of community mental health services for the city and county of San Francisco, and chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at John George Psychiatric Pavilion in Alameda. He is currently a clinical professor of psychiatry at University of California, San Francisco, and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Also, for the last six years, Dr. Forrester has been recognized as one of the best doctors in America. Dr. Schroffnagel has advanced training in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction, which have been the focus of her research as well. She is a member of the American Psychological Association, Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the Northern California Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Association and the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. And she also practices at Gateway Psychiatric Services. We welcome both of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Thank you. Us. So I'm going to get started. My name is Peter Forster, and, um, and I apologize. It was all my fault that we're starting late. So I'll just have to talk twice as fast. Um, my computer uh, had me logging into this for 30 minutes. Um, unremarkable. Anyway, I, I'm going to be talking about treatment options for bipolar depression, particularly fo focusing on the medications. Um, next. So I want to begin by saying that what we'll be talking about here is a particular form of bipolar depression. So we'll be talking about uh, pure or energic, low energy bipolar depression, which typically presents with lethargy, increased need for sleep, or increased time in bed, mental dullness, trouble making decisions. We're not going to be talking about what in psychiatry language we call mixed states, but what most people think of as sort of an agitated depression or an irritable depression. States where there's a lot of energy, turbulent energy perhaps, lots of shifting moods, um, as well as this dysphoria or depression. Um, next. So if we think about bipolar depression, what are the outcomes from the best treatment that that we can uh, come up with, um, at least from a psychiatric standpoint. And so this is the data that comes from the STEP-BD study, which is the largest study that's ever been done on the treatment of bipolar, um, funded by the NIMH multi-center, and every patient who was involved got a, a sort of panoply of treatment services that would not usually be available. So state-of-the-art treatment, at least when it was designed. Um, and you can see that as the study begins, we have 1,500 people. Initial treatment, the initial period of treatment, resulted in about 60% uh, getting to remission, meaning they were uh, well. But of course, that left 42% after that initial uh, treatment episode who uh, continued to be suffering symptoms, and at follow-up, so a two-year follow-up, again, throughout this entire time the patients were receiving intensive treatment, only 35%, or about a third, had stayed well. 23% um, of the total had relapsed from their initial remission, and 42% never got well. So uh, we can see that even kind of state-of-the-art treatment for depression leaves a lot to be desired. Next slide. So um, from a psychiatrist standpoint, one of the things that's important about depression and bipolar is 
that there were two recent large studies that suggest that having residual or continued depressed symptoms uh, is a major, maybe even the major predictor of treatment non-compliance with medication. It makes sense if what people come in to get help with is depression, which is the case for most people with bipolar, and the medications are not helping with that. It kind of makes intuitive sense that people would stop taking the medications. Next slide. So prior to 2013, um, there were only two FDA-approved treatments for bipolar depression. Um, now, of course, a, an FDA approval doesn't necessarily mean it's the most effective medication. Many medications that we routinely use never got approved by the FDA because they were generic, so no one funded the studies to show that they worked. But there were only two uh, medications approved, the olanzapine fluoxetine combination and quetiapine. And then in 2013, the FDA approved loracidone, or Latuda. Um, quetiapine, also known as Seroquel. Next slide. So I just want to quickly run through um, a list of treatment options in terms of medication. Mood stabilizers, um, and in general these have some but limited effectiveness in treating acute depression. Um, they may be better at preventing depression. Um, atypical antipsychotics, and as I mentioned, these are the only FDA-approved treatments of bipolar depression, either atypicals or combinations with atypicals, and then antidepressants. And of course, this is hugely controversial, but widely used in the treatment of bipolar depression. Next slide. Um, what I mentioned, brain stimulation, um, the most effective treatment for uh, severe depression in bipolar appears to be ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, um, a study that was just published in the American Journal from Norwegian uh, researchers looking at inpatients, meaning people with severe bipolar depression, where they were randomized to either getting ECT or getting, again, state-of-the-art psychopharmacology, um, showed that there was a clear benefit to ECT, about a doubling of the number of people who had a good response. And interestingly enough, in this study, which of course we can argue about how it was designed, um, ECT ended up having fewer side effects, which I think is probably mostly a reflection of the fact that many things that we think of as side effects of medications are often side effects of depression, but in any event. Um, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is much safer, doesn't require anesthesia, etc., is at this point still in the interesting, but we don't know enough to know whether it works for sure. Um, glutamate, I just want to mention because, not because ketamine, which is the primary glutamate and uh, at, antagonist that we use right now is it's not a, a useful treatment for many people because it requires repeated infusions, but it does open the door to a number of new treatments that are coming down the pipe. And then finally, I want to mention dopamine, where we found uh, that pramipexol, also known as Mirapex, uh, and other agents that are primarily used for Parkinson's disease, which of course is a disease that involves low dopamine, uh, just as um, depression can involve low dopamine, uh, that these medications can be helpful. Next slide. So let's dive in a little bit more into the specifics. So I mentioned mood stabilizers, and here I'm going to talk about three. So lithium. Um, we still have kind of mixed evidence for effectiveness in acute depression, um, but I think it's reasonable to conclude that lithium is somewhat effective for acute depression, but it, for it to work, it seems to require higher doses. The studies that don't show it work use lower doses, and it seems to take longer to work than other treatments. Uh, lamotrigine, 
good evidence that it reduces the frequency of depressive episodes, meaning it prevents depression, but really very mixed data on whether it actually works in acute depression in bipolar, even though it's commonly prescribed. And then carbamazepine or Tegretol, so small studies, but perhaps of all of the mood stabilizers, the data is stronger for carbamazepine than for the other two. But Tegretol is often not used, carbamazepine often not used because it's very complicated to prescribe. Lots of drug-drug interactions and the need for monitoring uh, is probably the highest of any of these medications. Next slide. So I mentioned the atypicals, Seroquel, quetiapine, probably the best data for effectiveness of any treatment that I'm going to be talking about. And it's important to not lose track of that. Um, however, Seroquel in clinical use is, in my experience, the medication that I can prescribe that is the most likely to lead to the following response from a patient. Yeah, I guess it's working, but I don't want to take it. So this is the number one medication in my practice that, in my view, and often in the patient's view, is clearly helping depression, but they don't want to take it and it's primarily because of its sedating effects. Um, so then lorazepam or Latuda, which as I said was just introduced, has really rocketed to the top of the list in our clinic. It has quite good data, almost as good as with quetiapine for effectiveness, and it seems to have a much better side effect profile, so not nearly the amount of sedation and weight gain. Uh, lanzapine or fluoxetine, which was marketed by Eli Lilly as Symbiax, um, is, the, is still the most effective treatment that no one prescribes. Went to a large conference of bipolar experts Speaker said, well, okay, so olanzapine, fluoxetine combination, we know it works for bipolar depression. Who's ever prescribed it? Large audience, two people raised their hands. So um, for whatever reason, people tend not to prescribe it, I think, because of the side effects of the olanzapine or Zyprexa component. And then eripiprazole or Abilify, which we certainly prescribed along with other people, now has a manufacturer sponsored so this was set up to show that it worked, study that was negative, meaning it didn't seem to help more than placebo. So I, I think that medication needs to kind of fall from the top list. Next slide. Uh, antidepressants. So um, part of the problem with medications is we give them names, so atypical antipsychotics. People freak out when they hear that. My God, why are you? I'm not psychotic. Why are you prescribed? I'm just depressed. Doctor, do you think I'm psychotic? Same thing with antidepressants. These medications are called antidepressants. People are depressed. They come in and they expect the doctor to prescribe an antidepressant. So it's hard to explain. Well, actually, for bipolar depression, these medications really don't work. And, and, um, I think the bottom line is, we used to say that they often lead to worsening. Uh, they can occasionally do that, but pretty much most antidepressants look about the same as placebo uh, in terms of uh, treatment of bipolar depression. So SSRIs are the most often prescribed, but again, they generally act like placebos. They, we use them primarily in a patient who's very anxious. Um, anxiety seems to respond to the SSRIs uh, kind of better than core depression. Bupropion or Wellbutrin seems to be the most effective of all of the antidepressants. And so if you're going to be thinking of an antidepressant, that's usually the one we think of first. And then just to mention a couple of other options. Well, one that is rarely prescribed, but again, as with carbamazepine, has some pretty good data. So monamine oxidase inhibitors like phenylzine, nardil, tranylcypramine, tarnate, and then selegilin patch, also known as NSAM. These medications are not often used. The studies that show they work are older studies, but I think they are still worth considering. 
for people with treatment of refractory bipolar depression. The medications that we tend to avoid are those that involve um, norepinephrine. Um, uh, and uh, so that's, for example, um, uh, medications like um, uh, atomoxetine or Stratera. Um, next slide. So I mentioned ECT seems to be the most effective treatment and then TMS data is just not there yet. Some interesting studies. Uh, next slide. And ketamine, I'm um, going to skip over this as well. Next slide. And then just to kind of wrap up medications, Pramopexol or Mirapex is a medication that's worth considering, especially for anhedonia, which lack of pleasure kind of depression, which is often thought to reflect uh, a low dopamine activity in the limbic system. Um, we've had some really good success with it. There are controlled trials. The main problem with it is the dosing. The dosing is hugely variable from person to person, so titrating to the right dose can take a long time. Next slide. So other treatments, we'll be talking a little bit about some components of psychotherapy in just a sec. Um, Modafinil, uh, Provigil, and Armodafinil, Nuvigil definitely don't seem to have strong or robust antidepressant effects, but they may be useful in people who have that kind of sleep all the way to noon effect, are not getting up, not getting any bright light, and are depressed as a result of that. So it can affect a secondary uh, contributor to depression. And then fish oil, we wish it worked, um, we still recommend it, but we'd have to say that after that initial um, finding that everyone was so excited about, the follow-up data is not hugely compelling. And then acetyl and acetylcysteine, another, another supplement, natural supplement, that is worth considering. There is some data that it seems to work, but it's kind of in the early stage of investigation. Next slide. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Forrester, um, and I'll pick up from here again. My name is Dr. Kelsey Schroffnagel. Um, I'm also with the clinic. So Gateway is an integrative treatment clinic, and so when we're working with people who have bipolar depression, we offer the pharmacological support. However, that can take a bit of time to kind of set in, so we also prioritize offering psychotherapy. And a significant component of our therapy approach includes encouraging behavioral change or behavioral activation, starting really with just one step at a time, starting with small steps. And I'm going to be discussing seven steps that we have come up with to help improve depression. Now, we consider these seven steps to be the fastest treatment for depression. And I'll be discussing more or each of these in more detail for the remainder of the presentation. So the steps we've come up with include getting morning light, exercise, social interaction, mindfulness, pleasure, mastery, and purpose and proactivity. And now we consider these steps synergistic, meaning that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Or the more of you do within these steps, the greater benefits you're going to see with improved mood. And now although these steps may seem simple and perhaps even obvious, they're not necessarily easy to implement and they're particularly challenging for those with, with bipolar depression. And so we spend quite a bit of time with our patients going over these steps, making individualized plans within each step, helping monitor progress, learn from challenges and successes within each of these steps, and then modify them as necessary, what's working, what's not working. And so again, although they're simple, it takes a lot to put into practice, and we really see success and progress um, as being taking consistent and small steps in each of these areas. So I'll be focusing less on the research in my portion of the presentation today, but I did want to point out that each of these steps have been found to be associated with improved mood and, deep and reduced depression. 
So a significant portion of these behavioral strategies are included in various evidence-based or supported treatments, which you may have heard of interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And we just, in our clinic, put these together, these seven steps together specifically to create actionable items that we have found um, to show improvement in our patients' moods. So the first one I'm going to talk about is morning light. And so by this we mean 45 minutes a day of bright light before 9 a.m. And 45 minutes can be a tall order for some. If that's the case, we start with five. We start with anything that, that's doable, that's possible. And now this morning light can either be sunlight. Again, it's summertime. Many of you may live in, in areas where there's sunshine in the morning, and that's great. In San Francisco, summer means fog. And so in this case, we would encourage therapy light, which can be purchased online for as low as $65. Now, morning light helps give us, gives us energy throughout the day, and it also helps us establish or maintain our body or our circadian rhythm, which is particularly important with bipolar disorder. And we've had patients who report noticing effects of making just this one change, just getting morning light um, within, a, they've noticed improved mood within a few days. Um, and I actually just recently saw someone, a client last week, who reported waking up feeling depressed um, and had a few minutes before getting to our session appointment where he just sat outside and got some sunlight and noticed effects on his mood in just, in just a short period of time. So we consider uh, bright light to be the fastest way to impact our mood. Next, I'm going to be discussing exercise. So this means 30 minutes of physical activity each day. Now, importantly, there's a large British study that, was, that found that those who engaged in regular aerobic activity had half the rate of depression as those who did not. And it also suggested that regular activity was shown to be more important than intensity. So it's important to get your heart rate up for the benefits, but it's not necessary to sign up for a strenuous boot camp gym class or something like that to notice improvements. And again, I want to just reiterate how incredibly difficult this is when we're depressed. And again, it's simple but not easy. And so it's important to modify this step as with all of these steps as necessary just to take any step kind of in these directions. So when I'm working with folks in our clinic, I might just start out with a five minute walk or asking, encouraging people to take a walk around the block just to get moving for a short period of time or I might even take a walk with folks during our session time together um, to start really motivating and increasing some activity. And as you can see on the right of this slide, we also want to point out that we can combine steps. And so we might include doing physical activity in the morning and together those would increase, um, increase our mood, give us some positive benefits. Next, um, we encourage social interactions, and we've identified three different parts of social interaction that are all important to have. The first one I would say we really encourage and utilize the most, and this is morning social contact. So ideally, this would be daily routine social contact in the morning. We sometimes call it cafe therapy, and so this might mean you know, waking up in the morning, going outside, and walking to a local cafe where you can engage in just casual conversation with a server or a barista, really asking, you know, how their morning is, sharing about your morning, maybe exchanging a smile or two, just kind of getting outside and, and being around people for a little bit. And this is another opportunity to possibly combine steps. So that might include a morning walk to a local cafe or a store if that's, um, if that's manageable in your area, in your neighborhood. We also find meaningful conversations to be really important. And now these are conversations, we are, this would mean having two meaningful, so intimate conversations where maybe you're discussing your feelings or how you're doing, at least two a week. Um, is, is important. And again, one of um, somebody that I was just recently seeing found this step to be really helpful to have this type of conversation with his wife. And it actually opened up discussion around how she can best support him when he's in this depressed mood. 
that she, her understanding was to just kind of back away and, and let him be. And in fact, he was wanting more closeness and, and more attention. And so this, um, this step allowed that conversation to take place. And lastly, it's important to have people you can count on. And um, for if we need a favor or we need support, which is particularly helpful when we're, when we're in a depressed state. And these relationships can be particularly um, difficult to cultivate as well, and sometimes it just takes time for these to unfold. Next is mindfulness. Now, John Kabat-Zinn um, is the founding director of the Center for Mindfulness and uh, um, at the University of Massachusetts and really a leading expert in the field. And he describes mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally as best we can. Now, mindfulness is probably something you've been hearing a lot about. It's, um, it's you know, being talked a, a lot about in, in um, the culture in general, particularly in psychology, definitely. And it's a helpful skill for depression in particular because when we're depressed, we often feel stuck in the past. We're kind of, where our mind hijacks us and we start to ruminate a lot about things that have gone wrong or ways that we might have failed. Um, hopelessness might set in. And mindfulness skills can help us increase our ability to unstick ourselves from those depressed ruminative thoughts and help develop the ability to guide our attention back to the present moment. So if we're on a walk, back to feeling the sun on our skin or listening to the birds or watching the leaves in the wind, things like that. And as some of you may know, if you've tried to practice mindfulness before, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of practice to learn this skill. And so we really encourage folks to practice for 15 to 20 minutes a day. Um, and again, this is a tall order. Some, you know, 15 to 20 minutes can be a lot. And so we might start with two minutes, two minutes a day, um, you know, more days of the week than not as possible can help just start to plant the seed and help to develop these skills. And um, we also suggest that folks start with an audio guided mindfulness exercise. So this could either be um, with a CD, um, which you could purchase online, or perhaps we, um, there's a lot of apps out these days that have various guided meditations such as Calm or an, another app called Headspace that our patients have found to be really helpful. Next is pleasure. Um, and so this means doing one enjoyable activity every day. Again, this can be challenging. When we're depressed, it's hard to find things enjoyable. And so if nothing seems enjoyable, then we ask folks to engage in activities that were enjoyable in the past in a non-depressed state. And we're also looking for the, for the pleasurable activity to be one that's positive and healthy. So um, recently I saw someone who was trying to advocate that eating half a chocolate cake was the pleasurable activity, and although in the moment that might be that might be comforting um, and possibly pleasurable, in the longer run, it led her to just feeling pretty guilty and more depressed. And so, healthy means at least not causing ill health. So, again, eating unhealthy meals, overeating on desserts, drinking, drug use, TV—these aren't necessarily what we're talking about. Um, we're really looking for things that in the long term are going to help you feel more positive, proud, productive, um, things like that. And I thought I would share another example from someone that I recently worked with um, where, again, maybe combining steps can be helpful. So in this case, we helped um, incorporate mindfulness into a pleasurable activity. So we were working on trying to get, um, get this client back to swimming again. She had always enjoyed swimming and hadn't been swimming for some time. And we, she, she ended up going to the pool, which was fantastic, but was really disheartened to again find, here's another thing I don't enjoy. Here's another thing that I used to enjoy that I don't anymore. And, um, and my life, you know, just again, our thoughts take it to a pretty hopeless place. I, my life doesn't have any enjoyment. So, but when we kind of unpacked her experience of swimming, we noticed that the whole time she was in the pool, she was still very stuck in these depressed, ruminative thoughts. 
um, and really beating up on herself the whole time. And so for the next time that she went to the pool, which she was willing to do, which was great, we tried to really practice on using our using the mindfulness skills so that she would focus on feeling the water on her skin, feeling her muscles move and work as she was going through the strokes. And she found for moments at a time at least she had a break from these depressed thoughts and found slightly more uh, enjoyment in her experience. The next step is mastery. Now this means engaging in a masterful activity each day. And so this is accomplishing a task, big or small, every day. And when we're depressed, often we don't, we don't see that we make accomplishments. We're not thinking that we're making a difference. And so it's important to make sure to bring notice to things that we're accomplishing. So this might be a task such as doing a load of laundry, it might be getting something done at work, maybe just doing a puzzle. Um, it might be taking a shower. And um, again, to help, help folks that I work with notice these accomplishments, I have them schedule these activities ahead of time, write down the level of mastery they experienced from maybe one to 10, one being you know, a, a, a minimum kind of level of accomplishment, but they did finish a task, to 10 feeling a great sense of mastery in a project that they completed. And also have them notice any other, any other effects that they noticed from completing the task. So mastery is a very important one that's well documented in the literature. And last step that we, that we have in our, our program is purpose and proactivity. So what this means is taking steps towards having a meaningful and purposeful life every day. So I might help my, the folks that I work with consider the following. If you're 80 years old and you have a lifetime achievement party, what would you want people to say about you and your contributions? It might be to be a great mom or dad or a spouse or that you've contributed to an organization or cause. And whatever it is, it's important to take a step each day to move in that direction, to give our life that kind of meaning. And similarly, it's important to be proactive in this, to plan ahead and to be intentional, right? So again, when we're, when we're struggling with bipolar depression, depressed mood says stay in bed and isolate and don't go do things, don't go to work. You're not gonna, you're not gonna succeed. And so we're, we want to practice not reacting to that mood, but being proactive about taking steps that are in line with these values, in line with what's important to us. And again, I know that this can be very much easier said than done. It can be incredibly challenging to do that. And, and so I often, as best we can, encourage doing what we need to do, not what we want to do in those moments. So um, I've gone through these pretty quickly, and if you're like me, you're probably feeling pretty overwhelmed by all these steps. And um, again, they're, they're very challenging for us even when we're not depressed. And so I thought I would run through just a brief case example to illustrate um, how one might get started with these steps. Um, so Dr. Forster and I have been working with a woman in her mid-30s, we'll call her Susan, who presented to us in a very depressed state, and this was following, <clears throat> excuse me, about two manic, um, two manic episodes. And Dr. Forster provided the pharmacological support to help stabilize her mood. Well, uh, she and I worked on the actionable steps to help improve her mood and get her re-engaged in her life get her back involved in things that are important to her. And possibly, as some of you are thinking, I mean, she was initially pretty unwilling to do these steps, stating that they wouldn't be helpful, that she's tried all of these things before. Um, and so that's where we started. We started there. What she was willing to do was to schedule weekend, weekly appointment times with me. And so, and she was willing to also schedule morning appointments with me. And so we used that to help get her up, get her out of bed and out in the morning light for a few minutes a day at least, just, um, just once a week. 
once we had kind of got our routine going with that, she started, she was willing to be able to sit in during our therapy session with a therapy light um, during our appointment. And so, um, and we did that for a few weeks until she actually then agreed to buy one. Um, and she um, would use that on the days that we did not meet, um, just during the time that it took her to finish her coffee. So she had her coffee anyway, she would turn on the light. Um, and, and started to notice, in addition to the medication, with the light therapy waking up, she did start to notice um, some change. Her body and circadian rhythms started to normalize, um, and she found some benefits from that. And then shortly after that, agreed to add in a cafe therapy. So instead of having her coffee at home, she would wake up and um, get outside, walk to a cafe, and have her coffee at the cafe instead where again she had some morning interaction with folks and um, Dr. Forster and I together came up with the idea of having her collect um, coffee stirrers every time that she went to the cafe which she would tape to her refrigerator as a reminder of the accomplishment that she made that day which provided, with, um, provided her with a small sense of, of mastery. So in sum, um, you know, we went over these seven steps that help improve mood. Getting morning light, um, getting some activity, social interaction, mindfulness, pleasure, mastery, and um, purpose and proactivity. And as I just described in that brief case example, it's important just to begin, just to pick any single one of these that you can do for even two minutes in a day when we're depressed. And, um, and and start with an easier step. If one seems easier than another, fantastic. We start with that one. And then as, as possible, um, then, then you'd add on as you go. Um, I also want to just mention that it's so important to have support from others and encouragement from others in this process, whether it is from a therapist or another type of provider or if um, you know it's a family member or friend, but somebody who can help have hold some accountability or just offer kind of some encouragement as necessary, I think is incredibly helpful for folks. Um, and lastly, this idea of progress, not perfection. So as best we can, we want to hold a compassionate approach towards ourselves in this process. That there's no perfect way to go through these steps and progress again means just taking small consistent steps towards these goals. So thank you so much for uh, for your time. Dr. Forster and I are honored to have shared this information with you. Hopefully you found it to be helpful. Um, we have a lot more information about our clinic and mood disorders, um, bipolar in particular, on our website at gatewaypsychiatric.com. And we also wanted to share about our sister website, which is called uh, Mood Surfing. It's at www.moodsurfing.com, which has um, extensive free resources for folks who are trying to live creatively with moods. Um, we have an ongoing blog um, where Dr. Forster and other providers um, post blog posts. We have interviews with experts in the field and also have a free online forum um, actually that's moderated by clinicians which we find um, our clients and people in the community find to be really helpful so please check that out um, if you'd like. So at that point um, I think we will hand it back over to Debbie and we can open up for some questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. We do have several questions um, already, so I'll get started. Um, first of all, do you have any advice for patients with ADHD as well as bipolar 2? Well, um, of course, it's common to have problems with attention with bipolar uh, for a number of reasons. So I guess the one thing I'm going to just say is, um, in our experience, it uh, is often helpful to make sure that the ADHD diagnosis has included some psych testing because, for example, uh, we were just preparing a uh, document for one of our patients 
uh, submitting it for um, uh, for her uh, medica uh, medical school application, actually. It, uh, the psych testing showed that she did have problems with attention, but they weren't ADHD-related. Uh, so there are core aspects of inattention that are related to depression and bipolar. Um, so that's the first thing, is to make sure that you're dealing with ADHD. Um, and then we certainly have found that for many of our patients, stimulant medications um, in conjunction with a mood stabilizer can be um, very helpful. And um, there is also some pretty good data showing that uh, two other non-medication approaches are useful. Uh, for example, mindfulness meditation. I know we, we're sounding a little bit like uh, mindfulness shells, but we're not paid by anybody to talk about it. Um, is very helpful for many people with ADHD, including those with bipolar, as well as um, there's an interesting device uh, put, uh, uh, manufactured by a company called HeartMath, which provides biofeedback, which has also been shown to significantly improve attention. Um, Wonderful, thank you. Do we still have you here? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the answer. Um, the next question, let's see. What are your thoughts um, about ECT or on ECT? Well, that's a big question. Um, what are my thoughts about ECT? Well, um, one thought is, that it's a potentially life-saving treatment that in, uh, certainly in Northern California, we don't offer to enough patients. Um, uh, you know, the, the example that always sticks in my mind was um, a, the wife of a physician who came to consult with me when I was uh, early in my practice. Very charming woman, nice conversation, Right at the end of our initial consultation session, I happened to realize, gosh, I haven't asked about suicidal thoughts. And uh, so I did, and she said, oh yes, well, every night when I'm at home, I pull a gun out of the desk drawer in my uh, office and I put it to my mouth and try to decide whether to shoot myself or not. Um, so I, I called my wife and said, I guess we're not, I'm not going to be coming home tonight. Um, and we came up with a crisis plan, uh, managed to get the gun taken away, and got her um, started with ECT the next day. And within two days, she was no longer depressed. So it's uh, potentially life-saving. That's not to say that she didn't have adverse effects. She certainly had some memory problems. Um, but it's worth recalling how effective and quick it is. Great, thank you. The next question, what are the negative side effects of olanzapine? The primary negative side effect with olanzapine that we worry about is, um, well, weight gain and then along with weight gain, often related, but sometimes not related to weight gain, is its um, potential for causing people to develop glucose intolerance uh, as a precursor to diabetes. Um, and so when we prescribe olanzapine, we uh, monitor very closely all of our patients with lab tests, uh, which now allow us to, to determine pretty, with a, with a a pretty good sensitivity early on who is at risk and who is not. Um, so those are the primary ones, uh, weight gain um, and, and this uh, mm, possibility of increased glucose intolerance. Um, and then there is certainly sedation as well, less so than with quetiapine or Seroquel. Great, thank you. The next question. There has been a lot of talk about vitamin D levels. Does this explain at least part of the effectiveness of light therapy? And what about using supplements? Uh, interesting, uh, controversial topic. 
Um, so uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's an endocrinologist in San Francisco is actually uh, at kind of the forefront of pointing out the importance of vitamin D levels. Um, and so uh, since I know her, I got excited about it. And you know, certainly in San Francisco, there are plenty of days when there's not a lot of sun. So I thought, well, this could explain um, depression and fatigue. Um, long story short, I got vitamin D levels on everyone uh, that year in, my, in the clinic. And I have to say the results were not overwhelming. Um, so one thing about vitamin D levels is there are, there's essentially three levels. So above a level of 30, um, the person doesn't have any vitamin D deficiency. Between 20 and 30, it's controversial. Um, the Institute of Medicine recently came out with a recommendation that no one gets supplementation in that range. And almost everybody in my practice who I discovered did have vitamin D deficiency was in the 20 to 30 range. And frankly, I didn't find remarkable results in terms of improved mood or energy um, as I'd hoped to. Now, it turns out that under 20, um, there probably is some significant response, but it's a very, it's a very, it's a small minority of all people who um, might be considered deficient who are in that very low range. Uh, and for them, certainly vitamin D supplementation is, is useful. Excellent, thank you. The next question, how well does Wellbutrin work for the combination of generalized anxiety and depression, and is weight gain a common side effect? So bupropion or Wellbutrin was actually studied by the manufacturer, uh, Glaxo Welcome, um, as a potential weight loss medication, um, and they, they did a huge number of studies on it. Came back, yes, it does cause weight loss, but about two pounds on average which was not enough that they were ever going to get an FDA indication. So it's one of the rare medications in psychiatry where um, it's associated on average with some weight loss. Um, back to the topic around anxiety. Here I have to say that there's a remarkable difference between the handful of studies that have looked at this uh, in a research context and my own clinical experience and perhaps that of others. Um, so the clinical studies suggest that as it improves depression, it also improves anxiety. So leave that for the time being. My own experience is that that's, that uh, agitation and anxiety being induced by the medication are the number one reason why people can't tolerate it. So I have trouble sometimes reconciling the two. Uh, in my practice, what I usually do is start with other medications if anxiety is the primary uh, target symptom. Great, thank you. Um, next question, do you have any comments on the gut and mental health? Um, the gut and mental health, well, now that's a big topic. Um, um, hmm. Well, I don't need, I hardly know where to where to go with that. Um, so the the uh, GI system, the gut, as you will, is um, the site of the second brain that we have. So there's a um, a second uh, nervous system that has its own neurotransmitters that um, wraps around the GI system and it affects all aspects of digestion and unfortunately that nervous system is only um, indirectly connected to the rest of our nervous system, to our brain. Um, and so um, there's a complicated interaction between the two. Sometimes things that improve our mood can improve our GI system functioning. Um, but actually sometimes they can have the opposite effect. Um, and uh, 
um, I, I guess that's the short answer. I mean, there there are many different ways that we could go with that question. Great, thank you. Um, any information about in, insomnia coping skills? It's clear that sleeping aids are temporary. What other things can we do to help this? Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, and I think it'll have to be the last, because I have a patient at 10. Um, but um, I don't think this is a plant, but if you do go to our moodsurfing.com website and type in the search term insomnia, you'll get uh, a link to a page that's all about this topic. Um, and at the bottom of that page, you'll find a link to uh, a resource that I think, again, don't get money for this, but I think is a great resource. It's an online source of what's called CBT, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. Uh, you'll also find a, a, a blog post that I just posted last week that's yet another study that shows that for insomnia, not necessarily insomnia associated with bipolar, but just general insomnia, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is more effective than medications, even though it's hardly ever used and often difficult to find. So this online resource, I think, is a great one. Great, thank you. Do you need to wrap it up, Dr. Forrester? Um, I do. Okay, well, thank you so much for your presentation and your insightful information. Um, if you have questions that were not answered, um, you can email them to me at dbrown at ibpf.org and possibly I can forward those to you, Dr. Forrester, to answer at your convenience. Sure. Um, and I just wanted to remind all of you that this presentation has been or is being recorded and will be archived on our website for future viewing or sharing. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope your day is wonderful and we'll see you at the next webinar.